Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. I'm Jay Griffin. I'm the chair of the Hawaii PUC. I'm joined here by my two fellow commissioners, Commissioner Jennifer Potter, Commissioner Leo Sunsian. Uh We have a whole group of our staff here, but for the sake of time, um, we're going to cut right into the, the format of the status conference today. The purpose of the conference that we've asked for is for Young Brothers to provide the commission the consumer advocate and interested stakeholders with an overview of their proposed changes to livestock procedures. In addition, the commission is interested in hearing from stakeholders and the consumer advocate about their potential concerns with the proposed changes. Uh, but I want to emphasize here, I think given the, the time frame we have available, we, we really want to hear your ideas on possible alternatives to uh, what Young Brothers has proposed and your ideas about what our next steps could be uh, to address some of your concerns. So I think we've we've heard a lot through the public meetings throughout the state about people's concerns. We really want to hear about what can be done going forward. Uh, so when stakeholders have a chance to speak, please uh, hopefully uh, pri prioritize your time trying to address those matters. On September 25th, 2019, Young Brothers filed an application for approval of a general rate increase and certain tariff changes. The commission has held public meetings on each island to hear comments and about the proposed rate changes. As I said, during these hearings, the Commission heard the concerns um, in the letter titled the Customers Proposed Changes to Livestock Procedures. On January 23rd, the Commission notified Young Brothers it was planning to hold a status conference to gather more information about these concerns. And the aim of the status conference today is to hear from both from Young Brothers so that the Commission has a full understanding uh, the situation here and to give interested stakeholders an opportunity to provide your feedback to us. The uh, Commission reminds participants that the status conference is specific to these changes. We're not here to discuss the rate case, uh, the proposed rate increases. We're here, we want to focus on the proposed changes to the handling livestock. Uh, our format and just some housekeeping matters. Our bathrooms are located downstairs. Uh, the access codes are on the table there. Please silence your cell phones uh, if you need to. We have uh, stakeholders both in the room and on the phone. And I guess I want to reiterate, this is a, uh, we're, we're breaking some new ground here at the commission. We're holding a meeting of this nature and trying to connect everyone remotely. So please uh, afford us some patience. Well, we're trying to hear from everyone, but if we have some logistical problems in connecting with people on the phone, please um, uh, give us some patience. And for people in the room, uh, when you want to come up and provide comments, please uh, sit at the, the seat next to the consumer advocate there so you can speak into the microphone so folks on the phone can hear. We'll also have a wireless microphone, but I think what we identified would probably be best if you come up um, and speak from the microphone there. For stakeholders on the phone, uh, you'll be muted until your time to speak. You can unmute your line by pressing star six if you're on the phone. Or if you access, to, if access us through Skype online, then you can mute and unmute, unmute by hitting the microphone button. We'll let you know when you're unmuted and you can provide your comments uh, when we get to that portion of the conference here. Uh, we've allocated the first 30 minutes of the meeting today for Young Brothers to share its presentation. Uh, we, we received that earlier, and I believe we put it up on our website on the homepage. It's up on the Notice for Status Conference page. There's a whole page for it. Okay, on our homepage, there's a link to this meeting, and the uh, presentation is up there. Um, let's see. But then the remainder of the meeting will be reserved. We're going to start with uh, comments from stakeholders uh, for those that have RSVP'd, uh, either by phone or uh, in person. Uh, we'll run through the list and we'll listen to the feedback and comments. And with that, um, if you did not reserve time, um, we'll speak. Maybe we'll ask at the end of the meeting um, if other people that have not RSVP yet would like to provide comment either by phone or here in the room. Um, and just to give the full amount of time possible, we wanted Young Brothers to go, but we also wanted to have stakeholders go next. And then the remaining time, uh, we'll turn to the consumer advocate and. Uh, have an opportunity for comments and feedback, uh, including the consumer advocate. So with that, um, we'll start with Young, Young Brothers' presentation, and thank all for being here and uh, you know, providing time and participation 
everyone here in the room and on the phone uh, likewise. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Anna, and I'm the president of Young Brothers. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to thank uh, Chair Griffin, uh, Commissioner Potter, Commissioner Asuncion, and the Consumer Advocate, the Department of Transportation, Harbors Division, and all the interested stakeholders who took the time to be here today. Your thoughts and feedback are important to us and to the success of our business. We appreciate this opportunity to present on Young Brothers' proposed changes of livestock procedures and to address any questions or comments. Accompanying me here today are Chris Martin, our Director of Terminal Operations, Keith Kiyotoki, our Manager of Sales and Marketing, and Sandra Larson, our Vice President of Legal, Regulatory, and Government Affairs. All of us are here with the objective of clarifying the misconceptions and addressing the concerns that have been conveyed during the course of recent public hearings, and to facilitate a path forward to ensure frequent, reliable, and affordable service to our livestock customers throughout the state of Hawaii. Before we jump into our presentation, I'd like to briefly emphasize three critical points of our presentation, with the first being safety. The dedication of our employees is what has made Young Brothers one of Hawaii's oldest kama'aina companies. Their safety and the safety of all those with whom we do business is paramount. As our team will discuss in more detail, the shipping and handling of livestock presents a number of unique operational challenges for Young Brothers, and these operational challenges have occasionally resulted in incidents that jeopardize the safety and well-being of the livestock being shipped and of Young Brothers customers and employees. That being said, our commitment is to safety, and that is not one that we can compromise and we must ensure that we consistently monitor and comply with safety laws and regulations across all areas of our business. The second point I'd like to emphasize is that while concerns related to the proposed changes of livestock procedures have been expressed at public meetings and conducted in conjunction with our rate case, these changes were intended as a proposal to address concerns related to safety balanced against our customers' needs. We're not asking for any of these changes, changes as part of our current rate case. My third and final point is that discussions with industry and other related stakeholders are currently ongoing. As recently as this past Friday, the YB team, DOT Harbors, and a focused group of frequent livestock shippers met to clarify specific concerns related to our initial proposal. As a result of that meeting, YB issued a notification to livestock customers confirming that the, the proposed changes were intended only as proposals for further discussion and as such that changes related to livestock transfers and acceptance of shipping devices were not being placed into effect. While a date for our next discussion has not yet been set, the group has agreed and committed to collaborating to address the issues and concerns of all parties to include but not limited to Young Brothers, the livestock industry, DOT Harbors, the PUC, the Consumer Advocate, and other state and federal regulators. So again, mahalo for all of your time and this opportunity to present, uh, and we'll, we'll start off with Chris. Thanks, Jay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Chris Martin, Director of Terminal Operations. Um, my responsibility is operations statewide uh, for Young Brothers. Um, I wanted to start off with just kind of talking about our livestock shipping. Um, we ship livestock to all the ports uh, except for Hilo. The transit is uh, beyond 24 hours, uh, which is why we don't ship out of that port, but we ship out of the Big Island, um, out of Kauai High. Um, to minimize the transit times, we try and prior. We we don't try. We actually prioritize the livestock loading and unloading. Um, we put them on a last uh, last on first off position. We treat them no different than our perishable cargo. Um, our stevedores do a great job of handling the cargo, not only in the terminal, but on and off of our vessels. Um, an island ag discount is applicable to livestock uh, based upon the statutory guidelines. Um, we ship about 4,700 shipments of livestock over the last decade. Um, 
and I, and I think we do a great job. Moving on to the next slide. I'm gonna talk about the proposed changes. Um, these, these proposed changes was, was based upon numerous meetings we've had with, uh, uh, with, with our livestock shippers, uh, HCC, and number one basically highlights um, opening up a Friday saline out of Kauai High and the Wheelie Wheelie. Um, as you guys all know, we invested $80 million in new tugboats. Um, our older vessels weren't able to make the transit in a timely manner, which arrival into Honolulu on a Saturday was in the afternoon. Um, with these new assets, we're able to actually um, have a better transit, allowing us to open up um, a sailing on this Fridays, which is an enhancement to the, to the current service. Um, the second proposed change is standardizing the acceptance and delivery of livestock. Um, across the state, we found that there was numerous cutoffs, some that were longer, some that were shorter. Um, and again, looking at the safety of the animal and our employees and customers as the priority, we wanted to make sure when it came to the animals that they didn't have to sit in port longer than necessary. And so one of the things we did with talking with the livestock industry was looking at a time that made sense for both the animal and for us to maintain our sailing schedule. And so what we did was we extended the, the, the delivery. Um, instead of being 11 o'clock, for an example, customers can actually deliver the animal up until gate closure, which would be 3.30. The reason you see 90 minutes up there is we have a Kauai sailing that leaves Honolulu on a Monday and a Thursday at, at 12 o'clock. 90 minutes is about the time it takes for us to safely receive the animal, um, conduct the proper documentation, position it on the snow plan, and load it to the vessel. Um, that's the latest we can offer um, to the livestock industry. But again, it's an enhancement to the 11 o'clock cutoff. Um, and what it does is allows the animal not to have to sit there. For example, in Kauai High, if they were dropped off at 11, they would sit there till about 6 p.m. that evening um, which is the average departure in Kauai. Um, another enhancement um, to the current service. Number three, um, again, with the animal safety and the safety of our employees and customers, transfers is an issue for us for multiple reasons. One of them is we've had instances in the past where animals have actually gotten out of their shipping device and were on the pier. Um, by eliminating the transfers, we believe we can make it safer for two reasons. One, the animal should be ready to go when we received, putting our employees so our employees are not at risk. On the delivery end, if it's in a container or a trailer, we can actually deliver it in a faster um discharge as one of the concerns for the livestock shippers. They said, hey, can you look at creative ways where you can get the animals discharged off our vessels sooner than later? Um, I can point out to the map up here, an aerial view of our facility in Honolulu. This was one of the vessels that the livestock was loaded on. To get off of the barge, they would have to get discharged off the barge, put in an area, which is we, we identified as a Libby lot, it would have to get transferred into another shipping device to go outside of our gate. Then it would have to go to customer service, signed out at the auto station, and finally out our gate. If I count it correctly, it's about a six month process in our already congested port. The container, if the animals came in in a trailer or a container, and loaded as priority, as soon as we ramp these barges, the animals could come off onto a trailer, onto a truck, and out the gate. So it's a, it's, it, it reduces that. But I wanted to also point out that currently this is where we allow our livestock to be stowed. Actually, I should focus on this. Our livestock is stowed in this area, staged. We're going to soon lose this, this area of our terminal to the KCT project. So by end of summer, we will no longer have access to this area. And we're already dealing with some other repairs throughout the Honolulu terminal. 
which is making the transfers more and more difficult for us to do it safely. So now, by September of this year, I will have to find an area in my terminal, and I'm already losing 20 to 25 percent percent space in other areas to safely transfer livestock. So it's a proactive approach because we foresee down the road there'll be problems, and we don't want to hamper any shipment of livestock in the future. Box laws. Um, our proposed changes is, is, again, moving it from something that is more homemade than something that is designed to be shipped. Um, trailers are built to carry animals. Again, this is conversations we've had with the industry. Um, containers have been used in the shipping industry for years. We're one of the few, if not the only ones, that allow a box of this, of this nature. Um, there's some regulations that are concerns for us. Um, we're regulated by the state and federal. I, I just don't see this being a long-term solution for the livestock industry. Um, it is a shipping device, but it's not to any standard. Um, I think the industry has up to 2022 to create some type of certification. Um, again, with the safety of our employees and the animals, um, our proposal is, is to eliminate the transfers um, as well as the box stalls. Um, these devices are also stored on our piers. So when I go back to our terminal space and our layout, we're running out of space to store stuff um, statewide. It's very difficult for Young Brothers to, to keep these devices in our port, especially when we're going to lose this Libby lot, as I referenced, um, sometime towards the end of summer, early fourth quarter of 2020. Hi there. Uh, my name is Keith Kiyotoki with Young Brothers. I'm the um, sales and marketing manager here. And um, I wanted to thank you for everyone for attendance here. And I just wanted to go over some um, some few things. First of all, um, there was some misconception that was out there that was presented in some public testimony. But in regards to um, our current ocean transportation rate, even though we are discussing about the proposed livestock changes, we wanted to point out that there was some testimony that the, the cost to ship, you know, eliminating a box styles or shipping a trailer was going to be uh, extremely high. So what I wanted to show was, first of all, what's the shipping of a, a box stall. That is your typical size of box stall, if I can say. Shipping one horse, uh, freight rate is roughly about $92. If we were to move and eliminate box stalls, the movement of the trailer would roughly, and, and trailers vary in sizes. Uh, in this particular incident, a trailer 10 by 8 by 8 roughly can carry three horses, the, 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 the ones that we looked at. So roughly its freight weight for Young Brothers is roughly about $302. So that equi equates to roughly about $100 uh, per horse if you're looking at the freight weight. Also pointed out the cost to ship uh, 20 foot containers as well as as 40 foot containers uh, this is our current rates that we have um, uh, for customers that already ship livestock uh, with young brothers so as Chris was saying you know we have a lot, um, some proposed changes and I I wanted to give um, everyone some history um, there has been some long-going conversations with industry as well as you know the Department of Transportation all working in a collaborative manner so if you look at the um, first customer notice back in 2009 um, this is a federal regulation it's part of the Clean Water Act it's called the NPDES this was a notice that was sent not only to the livestock people but it was sent out to our regular customers and basically, it was Young Brothers needed to regulate the pollutant sources. So what happens is if a customer were to ship a pallet, we were required to make sure that they did take the pallet home. There was no shrink wrap. Before uh, even um, a barred sales, we had to make sure that none of the debris on our pier on our barges got into the water. 
So that's why we reached out to the livestock people and just made sure that, hey, um, discharge at the pier, make sure it's all cleaned up. So it goes back to 2009. Um, back in 2013, um, we had an employee that was um, severely injured uh, during the transfer of a bull um, from a, a pen to a trailer. He got loose on our pier. Uh, 2014, um, then we had, um, because we are tenants of the Department of Transportation, um, they um, asked us to implement some changes. Uh, they wanted to make sure that you know, all shipping devices were certified based on industry standards. And, and an, an effective date of May 1st, 2014, um, they um, did not want us to transfer livestock at the pier. So later on in 2014, on February 14th, we did send a notice to customers um, following that, that um, uh, the notice from the, the DOT, the Harbors Division. And, and since then, uh, right after that, um, we had, uh, you know, we said prohibiting of transfers of, of animals that was, as it says, following the DOT advice. Right after that, we, we had a whole bunch of uh, collaborations with DOT, the livestock, uh, livestock industry, and what we did was um, that was pushed back to, um, it was like May of, of 2015. So the whole timeline of this basically was we continued to collaborate with the industry. We collaborated with not only the DOT, we collaborated with the Department of Ag, um, the College of Tropical Agriculture also to try to come up with some shipping standards that was going to be safe for the industry, safe for our employees, and for the safety of the welfare uh, of the animals itself. So in 20, um, 2016, um, the effective date that you know we were looking at was or actually we collaborated to was July 1st, 2017, where YB would not accept certified shipping devices. And the industry as a whole was given a, a five-year timeline to find a standard for the safe transfer of livestock animals. Uh, so, you know, going into 2017, we had a few... Um, Animals that escaped, um, if you look at that, in, in July of 2017, uh, some goats escaped at the pier. Um, September of 2018, we had a, a pen slip off of the, of the um, fork pound pockets. Uh, so finally, um, we got the industry together, Young Brothers and the livestock industry got together on July of 2019 to just have a, a lot more discussion and then from there that's when we came out and um, and put the proposals out there. So that's where we are. It, it was intended as a as a proposal and have further ongoing discussion. You know the livestock is not a lot of revenue for young brothers. If you look at the chart it's under one percent of our total revenue. But we understand at Young Brothers the importance of shipping livestock. It's not only to, for the state to be self-sustainable, but it's also there's some cultural aspects on shipping, um, yeah, shipping um, horses. So if you look at on the um, second slide, um, it kind of shows most of our shipments of livestock, almost 80% is shipped in containers presently. The smaller portions of shipments occurs in, in box stalls. 
where there's sheep, horses, and there's some few cattle that are shipped in box stalls. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I um, want to ask our staff members of the commission if we have some additional questions for Young Brothers. Commissioner Potter. Hey there. Um, thank you so much for being here today. And we really appreciate the opportunity to sit down with you and have a conversation about these procedures and, and requirements that you've proposed and how they affect you know, our, our customers and, and residents here around the state. So thank you for that. I have a, a question, Chris. Um, you, you mentioned, and I quote, industry has up until 2022 to develop standardization. Um, who's, that, who's making that requirement? Um, so it references a document from DOT um, based on Keith's timeline um, that they gave the industry until uh, 2022 to figure out um, self, uh, a third-party certification process, standardization for both the shipping device and the transfer, safe transfer. So, so you actually have a few more years to, to work through some of these issues? Correct. With the different associations? Correct. Okay. So that proposed date that you had of April 1st is not anything hard and firm or fast. It was more of just a, to get the conversation started? Yeah, I mean, that's that's time from a meeting back in December with the, with the, with the stakeholders. And, and at the time, again, it's just a proposal. Um, we didn't want to just throw it out there. There's a, there's. There's some issues, uh, the, the construction projects at KCT um, are happening, um, and they're going to go into effect shortly. I mean, I think they're wrapping up wrapping up phase one, and then they're going right into phase two. Um, so when they get into phase two, we're going to have to clear out that Levy lot. Um, so again, we're trying to be proactive um, instead of reactive, and we're trying to get that out to the industry, letting them know that the, pay, the, the peer con space constraints are an issue for us. We don't have anything right now where we can move or any other piece of land near the harbor where we can go to. So transfers are a concern. Um, so we kind of want to expedite that discussion and expedite you know, that shipping device and that certification for the safety of both the animal and employees. Okay. What, can I, what, oh, can yes, I expand sorry. on that uh -huh. a little bit? Yes. So you know, as Chris mentioned, you know, the dates that were placed on the proposal were really to solicit and spur some conversation and dialogue. So. You know, again, as, as as we had these ongoing discussions and as recently as Friday, we issued a statement uh, confirming to the industry that, that those changes are not in effect. Um, but again, it was to spur some conversation. But as, as Chris mentioned, I guess what we have to be careful of is while, while we do have a couple of years uh, based on DOT's guidance, uh, the issue for us is going to be a matter of space. And so what we conveyed to the group also on Friday was that in terms of timing of, of when changes uh, as we work through them uh, need to be implemented, that can occur anywhere between six months from now, right, which is when we're scheduled to lose that Libby area to, to basically two years, which is the end of this timeline. I just wanted to clarify that we don't we can't just wait till the end of the two years right right no that's important that was actually my next question okay. is when when actually do you perceive this project coming online of, of the real estate being lost yes so it is September within six, October of, of, this, of year. this year okay okay but that wouldn't be a concern on the other peers correct it would just be Honolulu where you're, you're really concerned about that transfer but primarily okay so right. um, but the uh, matter of safety is still relevant on all ports. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the case of Kahului, for example, the DOT uh, has provided us a space that we can safely provide transfers for. Okay. Um, but, you know, the shipping device is still an issue because even though we transfer um, uh, livestock within a confined area, if the shipping device is not certified and it doesn't meet certain standards, once it comes on property, it still provides uh, uh, a risk uh, for our, our workforce, our customers, um, and, and we want to make sure that we safely operate. If, if I recall correctly, the, the certification that you're looking for for, for the, the carriers would actually be, the, the, it was like the name of the person <laughs> and then um, the, the type of livestock that was, and then a, a certification, a, a notification of the third party certifier. Those are really the three requirements that you would need on any new device that would be transported. And that would lead you to some 
comfort and security that that these are adequate safe shipping safety. devices. Yeah, mm -hmm. at, at current there there are some standards being floated, but there hasn't been something that's been you know unlike our 20 foot containers and 40 foot containers for example or trailers that are deemed roadworthy right they're certified by either the US Coast Guard or the department or the DMV the pens at current are not certified by any particular standard except for self certification by the shippers themselves uh, so the the prescription by the DOT was to find a third party certifier and for the industry to work to develop a standard that meets meets the requirements of, of all livestock shippers. Yeah. I mean, just to touch on what Jay's saying. So when we when we take possession of cargo from the shipper, that, that responsibility falls onto us as the as the carrier. Mm -hmm. And if I if I were to reference containers, containers have an inspection program um, where they certify whether it's a new container five years or if it's an older container 18 months. And we're just asking that if there's a certification that proves that this shipping device is certified to ship safely to and from the barge, um, we, would, we, we would consider that, right? But we will, again, we, when we receive that container or shipment, no matter what type of commodity it is, we, we assume that liability and responsibility. So to that point. How many how many entities are there within the state that could actually certify would be qualified to to provide third party certification for these stalls? We don't know the answer to that. You don't. You don't would, would you attempt to actually provide a list for each island that would you know enable livestock shippers to ha find people that would be able to I'm, certify? I guess what's what's complicated. Um, in this regard is that, uh, and I think it was referenced, I don't recall, but I, we threw discussions about it. I think it was referenced in our presentation. From a benchmark standpoint, no other shipper allows use of this type of shipping device, right? The, the standard for all shippers is to use basically a trailer or a 20 or 40 foot container. And I think for that reason, right, you know, in that regard, whether it's the US Coast Guard or some other, or the DMV, those are the agencies that that manage um, the standards for those types of devices. I'm not sure, I couldn't speak on their behalf on whether or not they would take on the responsibility of certifying these other devices. Okay. Yeah, that, that seems like something we'd wanna work out sooner than later if it's gonna be a, a requirement. Um, and also you mentioned in, uh, in the late summer of 2019 that you met with the industry and then you subsequently issued the new proposals and require, the new proposed requirements. What was, was this, were those discussed at this meeting with the industry stakeholders? No. no. So what was that meeting about? Can you re recollect? Um, that, meeting, that meeting was just a meeting just to kind of go over current um, shipping methods and any issues. It was more of a, you know, partnership with the industry to show in good faith that we're working with them. So we had a meeting. Um, it was an introduction. There's there's some different people, new faces. Um, some of them at HCC, some of them on our side, and so we 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 came up with that meeting to just discuss just livestock, you know, from each port, things that were working, things weren't that weren't working, um, and, and the proposal wasn't discussed until um, after uh, probably late November. Mm -hmm. um, there's an incident, as as you guys might know, right? There's a cattle um, container that expired in transit to Noeli Wheelie, which struck which struck us at Young Brothers to look at our entire process um, and look at all the different things that we needed to, to kind of fix um, on our end. And then we came up and met with the industry and kind of talked through those um, to find a solution and a remedy moving forward. Thank you. Okay. You know, Mr. Um, you know, we spoke to the standard of safety, right? That these, um, these shipping for livestock would be safe. But is there an environmental uh, component to it too? I mean, right? You want it to be contained because you don't want to have it leak and X amount. But so, who manages that standard, and how does it eventually? blend in, right, if we're talking safety plus environmental, right, it, just, it seems to me there's going to be like multiple agencies mm -hmm. trying to figure this out, and, and I think you guys, we want to make sure that they're at the table to, uh, that they're, they're at least contacted to make sure that, right, it meets other, other right. standards as well. 
Um, and Keith, chime in if, on some history if, if you can, because some of the specifics I, I'm not first in. But, you know, based on the timeline that was provided, a lot of this was initiated based on the needs of, of the EPA requirements, right? So even at that time, the initial request to seek uh, certification of box stalls and other related uh, shipping devices uh, stem from um, regulations commentary about establishing some form of standard. But likewise, um, you know, and this is during the course of the history of this, this um, issue, um, there hasn't been an agency that stepped and said, well, you know, we'll own it and we'll develop the standards. It's always been saying, well, you know, YB work with industry and, and or saying industry develop the standard. Uh, and I think uh, Keith had mentioned at a point there was engagement of a group uh, from the University of Hawaii that was facilitating some of that. Uh, the byproduct or the result of it was effectively the what we have today, the self-certification by shippers themselves. But to your point, right, that is part of this. If I can expand on that, and um, what happened was, you know, when all these federal regulations started coming on board, you know, we partnered with the industry, you know, we partnered with the DOT. Yeah, and, and Jay is correct that, you know, we're not able to, there was no real agency that said this is how it should be done. So it, it relied on the industry to kind of help us along. And, you know, any type of spillage at the pier, we, we made sure that they were communicated that uh, the livestock industry, that they have to end up cleaning. And, and they, did a, they did a very good job. You know, over the years, the shipment of their equipment has improved, and they have taken steps to make sure that there is no spillage at the pier on our. But yeah, I mean, there, there really has not been an agency. I, I think, you know, where we're trying to go ahead and try to determine what is going to be right, because in, in one eyes, I may say it's acceptable. And in another person's eyes, it may not be acceptable. So we want to try to come with safe shipping standards that's going to meet the environmental as well as meet the safety of our employees, meet the safety of the livestock. So every year we get audited, um, the audit from the EPA. And one of the things they always highlight um, is that you know, if there is waste, animal waste on the piers that, you know, they ask us to clean it. Um, it's not noticeable for the most part. We live in Hawaii. It's pretty sunny and beautiful. But during torrential rains, um, some of these devices don't have a roof. And so when they fill up with water, um, they can't contain it. So we, all, we, we sometimes, and at one point, we actually got written up. Uh, we didn't get a citation for it, but we actually got it documented that we had you know, so many days to remedy the issue because the discharge actually um, was covering our, our Pier 39. So it used to get stowed near the water. Part of the reason we moved it from this location up here, it was better for the animal. Less traffic, less noise, out of the way. There's actually a fence around this whole area that creates a secondary containment. Again, this is the area that we're probably going to lose uh, somewhere around September, October. Prior to that, animals were stored up here, um, sorry, it's been wrong here, uh, Pier 39. Um, so when they would leak, they were right next to the water, and the waste would just fill up and drain into the ocean, which was a concern for them. Part of the Clean Water Act. Thanks. Uh, the sake of time, I just want to go to a couple of questions quickly and make sure we sure most of the time for the stakeholders. Can we go to the slides on the timeline? Or, our, <laughs> I just wanted to clarify and verify a couple of things while it's coming up. It, I understand it right. The Young Brothers have received guidance from the EPA back in 2009. There have been a number of guidances coming from DOT um, March of 2014 on prohibiting transfer. It sounds like in 2016, you had to standardize the shipping devices. But I mean, that, I mean, the EPA guidance is 10 years ago now. The other one is five years ago. So how can you help me understand why all of a sudden, it seems like when I look at this, it seems like all of a sudden now 
kind of the changes go into place. So what is <coughs> taking place over that time frame? And kind of what's the trigger? <coughs> Well, so in, when when it when it all initiated, right again, it was it was triggered by Clean Water Act, and so the industry did make some modifications to their devices to ensure and maximize the ability to contain uh, any, um, you know, whether it's feces or urine. Uh, so some of that did happen in that time, and and the focus wasn't necessarily on safety, right? It was fo focused primarily on on um, managing compliance with the Clean Water Act. Uh, you know, fast forward to 2014, I think it kind of also, it, it was also tied to the molasses spill that happened uh, in our harbor. Uh, so there was reinforcement of this. But again, the focus at that time was also largely on uh, compliance with Clean Water Act as opposed to necessarily safety. Um, at that time, devices were also modified. And that's what really triggered the conversation about uh, working with the industry to develop standards for the shipping devices. Uh, as well as uh, managing livestock transfers. So while there was some directive to say stop doing livestock transfers, there was a follow-up that said, okay, you can continue, but you know, in five years' time, you have to come up, right? And this directive was to the industry, right? Come up with standards and protocols for managing all of this. And, and that's kind of what leads us here today. As Chris mentioned, really what's happening now or what's triggering this now is first, you know, the loss of life as a result of the, you know, our mishap with the container, the, the 20 lost cattle um, in November timeframe, uh, reevaluating our processes as a result of that, and then communication that we're going to be losing peer space, right? So, again, that's those two events is really what's driving the sense of urgency to say, we need to make some change now because if we wait till we lose the peer space and we don't develop a plan, you know, you know, we won't have any alternatives. Does that help? So, I think if I were to summarize, you're the real precipitating events here are the loss of peer space and the incident you had okay. last right. year. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I just have one other question, Jay. In your intro, you talked about how you've been working and trying to form a group for further collaboration. The commission were to provide more structure to that than timelines with young brothers and participation by our staff that okay we would welcome that sure okay um so i think with that we want to move towards a phase here of uh listening to stakeholders getting feedback um i just want to we have semi-limited time we've had at least nine people sign up confirmed so we want to try and manage the time to make sure that everyone that is asked can get a chance to speak so i ask you to try and keep your uh commentary within say about five to seven minutes we'll loosely manage the timeline um because we want to make the we want to we want to have the chance to listen uh i want to reiterate a couple a few things just to in for the sake of time as I said, in our public meetings, we heard a lot about the concerns. I think, again, our purpose here today is about what, what can be done going forward. Um, so please, if you can you know, focus your discussion on one, kind of feedback on what you've heard today in the presentation, but also particularly alternatives that uh, your organization or the industry has been working on that can offer and any ideas on next steps that the commission can take to uh, foster better dialogue compromise here. Uh, so that's, that's just a, a request from us that we want to start. Um, we have a list of people here, but I want to recognize we have um, a member from Hawaii County here has come here. I understand left is a council member meeting council meeting this morning. Come over here and you signed up to speak. So, uh, Mr. Richards, if you'd like to come start and then leave after that, we have a group of folks in a room over on Maui, we'll shift over on Skype uh, to the folks assembled over on Maui. Uh, Mr. Richard, if you can sit, yeah, at the table, that microphone, yeah, that way people on the phone can, we believe that's the clearest that we'll have. <clears throat> Set to go, chair. Okay, uh, first of all, Thank you very much for hosting this meeting, have this conversation. I know we're here to discuss some of the changes going forward with Young Brothers. A little bit about myself. My name is Tim Richards. I'm a county councilman from the Big Island. I chair 
ag, water, energy, and environmental management. <clears throat> my background is also I'm a cattle rancher and been a veterinarian in the state for the last 35 plus years. Uh, a lot of what you're referring to, and first of all, I want to compliment Young Brothers. You know, I was listening, and you're talking about safety, both for the humans and the animals, and I applaud you on that one because that's what we're going to talk story about. Uh, we're talking about equipment and the equipment uh, availability as well as the the uh, usability of that equipment, both functionality but also whether or not it's secure and going forward. They also talk about being environmentally sensitive to both on the pier but also the, the near shore waters. We have to be mindful of that. I'm very concerned about that. I also heard you want to talk about standardized shipping. And I can appreciate that to a point, but we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, what I really liked is the tough story with the partnership and going forward between industry as well as the shipping company. Uh, this was in my testimony. I'm not going to repeat this, but um, long story short, the islands are different, and we all know that. And transportation for us in the islands is paramount, especially when it comes to agriculture. I represent agriculture. <clears throat> my roots are in livestock, but I represent all agriculture. We're not here today to talk about the tariff. We're talking specifically on services, and so I want to address that. First of all, we don't have the luxury of having the roadways that many of our neighbor states have, getting our commodities from the farms or ranches to the market, and that's one of the challenges. Our population center is a wahoo. It always has been for at least the last 150 years. If we're going to be truly agriculturally and thereby food self-reliant, self-sustainable, if you want to call it, we're going to have to get our commodities to our marketplace. That's where the transportation comes in. And that's why I really applaud Young Brothers for talking story about being mindful of a partnership between agriculture and transportation. We have to be mindful of that. But there's also the other side of that. Um, there's the service to the community. Since we don't have the roads, there are going to be for lack of a better term, those orphan commodities that we still have to move. And if we categorically deny them or price them out of the marketplace, we're going to destroy that. Big Island is has over 50% of our state land mass. It has something like 80% of the agriculture going forward. And if we're going to be striving towards that food self-reliance, we've got to get after it, but we're going to have to have that transportation in place. The thing I'm deeply concerned about is our agriculture, especially the little guys. And they're the ones that are going to probably take it hard as hit. I understand the 20-foot container. I understand the 40-foot container. I got it. Uh, and I'll come to that in a second. But we're going to have to come up with another metric. I hear what you're talking about on the piers as far as loading and unloading and potential safety thing. Years ago, we had pens on the piers. And the industry gave it up with the understanding that we, we would have the facilities on the docks to be able to transfer that. We did that knowingly with the understanding that would be coming forward. And that's what we're here to discuss today. How do we make sure this moves forward? From your perspective, I got it. Having a box come in and a box move out, and, and sir, I truly appreciate the fact your comments about sort of last in and last on and first off and first out. I like that because from a veterinary standpoint, this is something I've worked on for literally decades. So I like that direction going forward. But we've got to pay attention to the little guy that doesn't have enough to fill a full container or container, as it may be. I go back. I'm old enough to actually been one of the guys that loaded the open cattle barges. And I don't know if everybody in this room even remembers those. There's a few gray hairs out there that might. But that was a great way to ship cattle, great for the health of the cattle. Environmentally, we ran into some issues. And so we had to shift our equipment. We have to be mindful, and I appreciate the fact the concern for leaking containers, and there are ways to manage that. There are ways to service that. We have no guidelines that are within our nation, to my knowledge, that govern intrastate shipping when it comes to like this. This is upon us. And the, <clears throat> and the livestock industry, cattle specifically, but on the greater, has spent a lot of time working on those protocols on the interstate side when we put our containers to the West Coast. And we are very mindful of what we do to the animals and how that equipment is managed. So that comes back to um, intrastate shipping. How do we manage that? Um, I think if we go forward, we can look at parameters <clears throat> and – I'm not willing to volunteer or voluntold other people to, to do something if I'm not willing to do it. Um, commissioners, I'm very willing to work on protocols with 
with young brothers i have a thirty plus year track record of that most of the protocols that have been written nationally and even some of the stuff that was submitted internationally to oie actually came out of hawaii and myself and dr. jason moniz have written most of that stuff i'm very willing to work on that to have intrastate parameters that we can use one of the things i heard about certification if we're going to certify animals that comes down to typically a accredited veterinarian which is a national credit accreditation by the federal government but then you're talking health certificate and we have no guidelines that mandate protocols or health inspection within the state itself and that's going to add an additional cost very typically industry works with veterinarians and we have heard programs and health protocols set up so what you are getting is in healthy condition that's something i don't want to commit to more regulations because too many regulations are going to defeat us but i'm willing to work with protocols and come up with best management practices and all that to to have something coming forward coming to the equipment we can discuss about that i'm very happy to work with that and there's actually a lot of stuff in place right now for internship interstate shipping the little guy is what i'm concerned about and we have to talk on how to accommodate those which most commonly those little guys and like the single horses on the dock we have to have a way of managing that and i hear as far as getting livestock on the pier i remember the days when they used to jump out of the chute and go off the side of the barge i remember those days so i know what you're talking about but if we have a secured area at each dock that may be the best way to solve all of this like i said the industries gave that up previously having this cooperative relationship i want to see that this is not an adversarial relationship between the livestock industry and shippers it's a cooperation we've got to seek the the synergy between us all i looked at your numbers uh looks like 0.3 percent of the general revenue comes from livestock which not much uh if we look at the gdp of agriculture as a whole nationally it's less than one percent or statewide it's about the same it's about 0.8 to 0.9 percent that is one of those industries in our nation in our world that really doesn't generate a lot of net cash but truly we we die without it we starve so we've got to take care of agriculture and that's why i'm here to represent that so chair commissioners i appreciate your time and thanks for listening to me thank you council member uh i think we'd like to shift to the folks over on maui first up that we had on our list is uh brendan baltazar mic check are we good yeah perfect you guys go ahead hello yeah please go ahead okay you guys thought in with the right guy um like tim i've been shipping for over 50 years i remember the days when we used to load i remember jumping in the water and swimming out by maui palms to grab one steer before he got to the shore and like tim said we gave up something that we maybe shouldn't have the state came into play when we had that meeting and let me back up a little bit you know commissioners you asked why we had that meeting on friday the phone meeting there's a letter sent to sandra larson of caroline Nishida. the last page it says his young brothers facilitating the proposed discussion with in, interstate stockholders and how does it facilitate these discussions moving forward we never heard squat until the day before the 31st which would facilitate what they're supposed to do next thing going forward i'd like to clear some things up do you guys going to be posting things on the deal about trying to get um accurate information keith you know i never know you to be a liar but uh have guns without bullets and you always was a helper for livestock but you posted on picture those two shipping containers db7 is my shipping container for sheep and goats it's four feet high eight feet wide and ten feet long it is completely seven inches waterproof we can fill it up with water 
has double floors. You mentioned that it slipped off the forklift due to not having the right deal. That for that container has enclosed um, boxes for the container. I also made it wide enough that the small forklifts were prohibited from picking it up. The small forklift was the one that picked the damn thing up in between the two fork things, the fork pockets, right, things. And when the sheep shifted as it came off the thing, it flipped over. And that's how the sheep got killed and broken legs. Again, why me? Not me as the shipper and not the person who's picking it up. So let's get the facts straight. You know, the other photo that you have of a 20-foot pen, that's my old pen. There was another photo posted one time, um, sent to, and then I got hold of them, that YB posted with a bunch of leakage. Yeah, that's D, uh, D, Diamond Beer and Street. That was the old one. And there was, the, the thing was on the ground, there's a lot of leakage, piss, and urine on the mm -hmm. front of the, the deal. What they never showed was the back of the stall. And to this day, I still have the stall and I can send you guys the photos. You guys ran the big forklift forks right through the container's plywood, which caused it to leak. And fortunately, they did not break any leaks on the cattle that was in it. And then had the audacity to go send the photo and say, look, these are the kind of containers that's leaking. So the industry, I uh, wanted to say PUC commissioners, we met at the time when that bull ran off, right, and hurt the guy, and it, that was a sad case. However, at that point when they raised the flag and said no more shipping, as Keith said, we met. And when we met, from that going forward, we worked almost three years with Jason Muniz and with a bunch of us working with Young Brothers on their standard uh, requirements. Standard requirements meaning the horse has to be completely encased in the in the stall. Now, Keith, you show a deal for ninety-two dollars. I'd like to see where the hell you ship in that stall from Wailuku to Kaului. I mean, the analogy that I gave that you guys referring that it was mis uh, led was a shipment from Kaului to Kwai Hai. That was one hundred and seventy-five dollars. Kaului to Kwai Hai, not Kaului to Anlu. And that stall to go, you put up was seven by seven. Maybe you can put on miniature horse or on small one like we used to call the Molokai horses, but on average horse is about eight feet long. And part of our requirements, if you went and read the thing, it says the horse has to have a foot in between both sides, a foot in the front and a foot in the back, and a foot above his head standing normally. So we worked on all those things that the commission been asking you guys. And now, I want to get to another thing that was mentioned by Jay, which I know you was working for YBJ, but I don't know how many times you actually drove around on the port or with the, on the, on the, around the pier. But you know, you mentioned one thing that you say 20s and 40s are certified like by the Coast Guard, etc. It's bullshit. I made of 20 foot containers and most of them that is shipping livestock now is retrofitted containers. In fact, to be very specific, the two containers that I shipped was your YB containers that I bought from YB and retrofitted to make shipping containers. Now, the other thing you guys kept harping on is the safety, safety, safety. Yes, we were very concerned about safety. But for about five years, I pointed out at the Maui port where they staged the horses Two feet away from the storm drain, I said this is will be a violation for the Clean Water Act. Shirley Lee came to Maui specifically on Roy's um, orders to come check on A, answering the phones, and B, she went and checked on these deals. I specifically took her there, she took pictures, and what happened? Boy, the stalls moved for one week, and they were right back. When you talk about safety, some lady taking on some horse out of the stall, we had no transfer area and no water. Taking the horse out of the stall, and at that area <coughs> when they stage it, big fork leaves with 40 foot containers passing over it like on helicopter. Now, I mean, where's the safety concerns that you guys talking about safety, safety? That's bullshit on the safety. 
The other thing that you mentioned, Chris, about these six steps. Funny, on Maui, we go to the outgoing to the office, check out the deal, sign the paper, go to the thing, load the horse, and get out. We get one step. Now, Honolulu is different. And as we talked about before, but the commissioners don't, commissioners don't understand. And what I'd like to bring to the table is like, um, like, um, oh, shit. Who's just talking? Keith. No, the, the Tim. Tim, 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 Tim. Like Tim brought, brought about some history, because without knowing the history, you're not going to know what led up to it. And we worked a hell of a lot to standardize safety, um, no spillage, all of these things with YB, and it was accepted by YB. Then now, all of a sudden, they say no more stalls because you know, it's a safety issue. Well, on Maui, I don't know about the other islands, but on Maui, we have a safe transfer area. Now, Jay mentioned about these stalls being not certified and all that. Well, we had to build them according to their standards. Again, first line of defense, who? YB. Like the goats escaping. The forklift got, driver brings the damn goats there, and this guy grabs them out to put them in a on, in on dog kennel. I mean, when I brought that up at the meeting on Friday, I was told, well, we're just forklift drivers. We offered to do some training for your people, which now Chris is open to accept and say, look, this is the kind of things you don't do. But if you read the document that we provided, it says specifically container to container, which means there's no escaping. So if the guy came there and he wasn't going to go container to container and tie it, well, then he shouldn't have unloaded. Let the guy unload him again. All this was spurred from who? YB's mistake and the cattle dying. Now, when the cattle dying, it was in a 40 foot container, not on hostel. It ran away and ran away anybody. Now, those goats that was ran, ran away, and you guys putting them up on the screen, and I can, too bad I didn't um, have something from Shirley, but she remembered that specifically. And then the next load went. She went out and videotaped the thing, and that's when she called me. She says, hey, this is bullshit. We cannot do this. And Shirley's been retired already. So I don't know where this 2018 deal come. Maybe some goat that ran away from somebody's house that I don't know about. But the concern, again, is... Baltzar, can you summarize, please? Yeah, okay. The, the bottom line of all of this is cost. Let me see if you can give me your time. The bottom line is the, the cost. They call you got they, huh? You got my time for it. Okay, if Jimmy, okay with him. you gotta tell him if he's yeah. okay, Jimmy. Is it all right? I give Brendan my time. This is Jimmy. Uh, sure. All right. Okay, so now the the biggest problem why we why we are opposing if they change from doing away with the box stalls and forcing us to go with forties, twenties, and trailers. Remember now. Another thing was mentioned by, by uh, I think it was Keith, but I'm not sure. I think maybe it was Jay. No, Keith, because he said these trailers are certified roadworthy. They have the safety check. They ain't one damn trailer that is safe. They safety check to roadworthy that is waterproof up to 16, four inches, which is what we required for the stalls. None of them. So all going to have to be retrofitted. Second question, Commission, is this. If we put one goat or two goats in a, in a three in a stall and ship it, it's one cost. But now if we're going to have to put that goats in a 20-foot container, what's the cost going to be? The second thing is the cost again to ship it in a trailer. If we have one steer to ship to somebody for 4-H, like I ship to Molokai, they will pay the big cost for the trailer again. Now, assuming we go with the 20-footers, the biggest issue is that nobody talked about is the transfers. Now, the 20-foot container has to be hauled down to the pier because they're not going to be allowed to transfer at the pier. So that 20-foot container has a cost of $130 an hour PUC rate. I can speak for PUC, and you guys can go check my records. I am a PUC carrier, so I know the rate. The container has to go there with the person's horse, but I gotta take them someplace where they can load them first. When it gets to Honolulu, they have to hire a trucking company to pick it up and take it now to the nearest place 
which I assume is halal. They'll unload their horse. They still have to pay somebody to go take it home and bring it back the next day. And pay the trucker to take it home and bring it back the next day. When I call Anlulu to several trucking companies, Keith, this is where I got the numbers from. And you try to make it like, oh my gosh, you inflated it. Push it. I never inflate nothing. That's the cost. $130 on the average per hour, minimum two hours. And if they got a spot the container at the yard, it's a, it's a spot rate that they have to charge. Now, all of that transshipment costs for road taking off the pier, bringing back to the pier, is all to the shipper. And that is what we are opposing. Then shipping them in the smaller pens, the cost is cheap. Like you want to take your number of $92, or then think what that cost is going to be when you put that same cost in a 20-foot container or on a 20-foot trailer. And the trailers are measured from the front of the neck, if you go back to the picture of the gooseneck trailer, to the ass of the thing and the width on the outside of the fenders. You take that whole cubic measurement and you put the one horse inside. So it's astronomical. The rule changes, changes the cost of shipping. And getting back to what Tim was saying earlier, you know, one of the things that nobody really addressed was we as livestock shippers provide, build our own shipping devices according to YB standards. Now, if they want to have a third, third party certification, if they're honest, and Keith was in the meeting, and Davis is there now, he can attest to that. I brought that up. KTNS um, checks and fix the containers from Matson. They were willing to do it. And we were supposed to get stickers and all of that stuff from the state. We never get nothing, and it became self certification. But as far as the reasoning for the opposition of doing away with it, and another thing that um, Jay mentioned when you when one of the commissioners asked him, he says, okay, it can go from six months to two years. Holy Jesus. So what if it's six months? So we get six months to do what? Now, what is going to be facilitated between that time for us to either transition or how the heck we're going to afford to ship these livestock if they make us go with those three items to ship 20s, 40s, and trailers? How are we going to afford to pay people in Honolulu because Honolulu became the hub? And as you know, we had direct shipments before. And from Kwai Hai to Maui, they pass Maui, go to Honolulu, then put the horse back to bring them back to Maui. And I feel bad for the people in Molokai. Molokai gets the animals, and I'd like to see how they're going to address this part. When you put it, no matter what container you can put them, it goes to the night. When it gets to um, Molokai, it's 7, 8 o'clock at night. Right now, they go down, take their trailer, take the horse off the container, and then they can go back at the container. But how are they going to do that with the trucker going down there at night? They ain't going to go down there get them. The other thing that you guys brought up was the the developing standards. Now, Can you please summarize again? Whose standards? Uh, is YB going to provide the standards? Sorry, I think we just we want, we want to make sure that everyone that's asked to speak has time. What is he saying? He said if he wanted to know if everyone who was asked to speak had like, no, we want to make sure everyone has time. Okay, do you want to support? Yeah, I've got a short. Uh, who is next on this? Uh, Keith Unger. It's not on Maui. It's not on Maui. Is he on the phone? No. Yes, I'm, he's, he's yes, on, I'm on the phone. I think it's on a phone, but they're calling from uh, San Antonio. Okay. Yeah, if we can shift to Keith. Uh, Jimmy Gomes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you okay. Thank you. Because uh, I'd like to give, I, I don't have any further comment. Uh, Nicole and I are here, but I'd like to hear from uh, Jimmy Gomes. I'd like to give my time to Jimmy. Okay. If, if he would like to talk. Parliamentary procedure. Mr. Gomes, would you like to go? Ken Miranda would like to speak. Yep. Okay. Okay. Hi. 
Hi. Hi. Miranda. I'm the general manager of uh, Kamalu Ranch here on Maui. And, um, you know, in regards to all the, the topics that Tim and Brendan have, uh, have touched on, one is the safety of transfer on the pier. And um, as everybody has kind of reiterated as far as from the industry, uh, being able to, to transfer livestock on the pier is key uh, to making things affordable for to be able to transport our livestock from uh, one island to another. Uh, there has been uh, several different proposals as far as using panels, making sure they're tied to the trailers and the containers that the livestock is being transferred from and to. And of course, uh, making sure that when this occurs, uh, any uh, yes, that's left on the pier is swept up, shoveled up, and taken away from the pier. Uh, the other one is backing up container to container, which, as Brendan stated, alleviates the possibility of any uh, animal escaping, no matter uh, where the, the transfer is occurring. Uh, another point is the island discount. Um, you know, I've shipped several different classes of livestock, uh, cattle going to the mainland uh, via uh, Pacific Airlift, which come uh, from Maui on Young Brothers to Honolulu, and then go to the airport and get transferred onto Pacific Air uh, Airlift's boxes, and also shipped pretty much at the same time, cattle going just to Kunoa, uh, cattle company on on uh, Oahu, and the the rate for both was different. They're both cattle. So in in saying that, having livestock in general be afforded an affordable price, because this is what uh, is driving most of everybody's um, comments here is the cost that it's we're going to be incurring. Um, you know, as far as the containers, as I stated when I was at the meeting on Friday on Oahu, uh, you know, it cost me, and I'm just speaking for myself, a lot to maintain containers to ship, not to mention the, the chassis that I have to maintain that go under the containers. And with the requirements that have been stated, that Livestock is the only ones that have to provide our own containers. Every other form of shipping is provided, a container is provided for them. Uh, certification by the Coast Guard, uh, you know, there is a total different aspect of shipping um, these cattle that occur all the time going to the mainland on Matson, in that those cattle are, are contained for uh, five, six days at a time, but when they're out to sea, those containers are clean. The containers being shipped in our island are done, for the most part, under 20 hours, and those containers are uh, cleaned when they get to their destination. Uh, I know a practice that I put myself is putting bedding in the container which absorbs most of the urine and ammonia so that there isn't a wet uh, fecal matter sliding around in those containers. Um, and again, as uh, Brendan stated, you know, if we can kind of count on 2022 being the effective date and not the possibility of just having to have all of this occurring in six months uh, would really put a strain on the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Uh, next that we've had sign up is Randy Cabral. I believe is he on the phone? I, I am. I'm just going to stand on my testimony. I think uh, it's just going to be a repeat of what others said. So I'll just stand on the submitted testimony. Okay. Yeah, we we did receive your letter. So you say uh, 
You have nothing further you want to add at this point? Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cabral. Uh, next is Sandra Tran from the Hawaii Sheep and Goat Association, also on the phone. Set. Uh, you can press star six to unmute. Ms. Tran, not on the phone. Okay, we'll continue forward. That's where someone on the phone. So, uh, next one we have on here is uh, Mr. Yogi from DOT. <sighs> Hello, I'm Davis Yogi. I'm the Harbors Administrator. Um, DOT has been tossed around here, so let me just put things in perspective. The shippers, Young Brothers, Matt and Pesho, anyone else who brings cargo into the state of Hawaii, they need space. One of the things that we need to understand as we're trying to manage the, the harbor system is sometimes when people ask for things or services and support, they frame things in a different way. For example, on Maui, we were talking about a water line in a particular area. I made two trips looking for the water line. When the question is framed differently, how do we get water to the livestock on Maui? The question changed. The mindset changed. We asked the harbor master on Maui, where can we find water? We found water. And we found things outside of the, of the YB terminal. The question then changed to the credit of the harbor master on Maui. He found a water source at a place where we used to store tires. We removed the tires and we placed a location, work with young brothers as to how to do transfers. The requirements for the shipper, when they went from forklifts to nets to containers, it changed everything. The harbor system has not been able to catch up. Since 2010, revenue started to be generated for the development of that new Kapalama container terminal to provide for sustainability a container terminal on the side of a bridge that is not reliant on Sand Island and that bridge. So from a resiliency point of view, that container terminal that's being built is strategic to the economic security of Hawaii. To YB's credit, when you look at their picture, it looks like an ACDC guitar, but it just is how it's shaped with two necks. When you look at that, Everything that is in black, uh, for those that on Maui can't see, those are the asphalt areas along the piers. It cannot sustain a particular weight. When it was designed, it was designed with sheds, nets, and forklifts, I mean, hand trucks. The container um, warehouses that used to be there where they used to do brake bulk during the Lingua, Lingua administration was torn down to accommodate container operations. So within the last 10 years or so, a lot of things have changed, even at that pier, except their space. Okay. So as you have new entrants into the market, at this point it's Pesha. Pesha does not have um, barges or the manpower to handle neighbor islands. So they use YB as a subcontractor to take it to the neighbor islands. So it's a hub and a spoke where it takes to the neighbor islands. When we change the question as to what else we need um, and how we've been working on this, this binder that I have records all the emails, the photos to justify with everyone. Uh, I thought I would never see this thing again, but it pops up. Going back to 2013 to 2014, and I call it Shipment of livestock between the islands. That's, so the standards that we're talking about, um, 
let me take a short recess and give the commissioners five copies. One for the consumer advocate. And maybe another four if you can pass one on. And I have three for the uh, LW has one. And if um, Councilman Richards, if you can have one since you're out of veterinarian. So I have two extra copies if two extra copies if they need it. This is the document that uh, Commissioner Potter was talking about with regards to 2022. It started with we finding spillage and leakage from the containers, and we're under a consent decree by EPA that sets up a policy on stormwater runoff, the, the saying is only rain in the drain, which means everything else can't be in there. Under the consent decree, then we have to clean up storm drains to make sure everything is recorded to say what we're uh, removing from the storm drain system, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not a make-believe thing. It's very real. Uh, there was a fine associated with this. As a result, we required it for Young Brothers and all our tenants. Um, because we want to change our culture to be more environmentally friendly and not just take care of Honolulu where we have the consent decree, we now plan and operate with the environment in mind. Having said that, in this, we knew that shipping devices then had to be prepared. Um, we came up with a standard um, on one of the pages, I think like page four or five, the so-called bumper sticker. We weren't ever going to present these bumper stickers. Industry was considered about self-certification because of cost. They did not want the state to require it. We said, give it a shot. However, we needed to standardize at least what we're looking at since every shipping device could be made out of plywood with round holes, it could be one shipping device does not fit all animals, right? I mean, goats are shorter than horses. The, when they do things, it's you need to make sure it's suited for a particular animal. So the bumper sticker idea was, how do I solve this problem? I went to Google, found this, and for 500 stickers, they can make their own self-certified for 50 bucks. Reasonable, self-sufficient, if they, if industry decided. All we asked for was, who's the guy that will be certifying it? So we relied on industry to self-certify. And working with uh, uh, Ashley Stokes from the University of Hawaii, uh, at that point, she was the Department of Tropical Ag <laughs> veterinarian, working with uh, Dr. Muniz from the Department of Ag, with the support of uh, the Department of former chairman back there of Ag. Um, we were supportive in, in doing this. We came up with some standards that was fair to everybody, but not everybody belongs to industry. Some people belong to their own. Um, as we said, what I heard from um, Councilman uh, Richards, the little guy is going to do their own thing. So there are standardized containers that should be there, but it might not be available to everybody uh, for everyone's use. Uh, and there are different animals, and there are even different types of customers. Some are recreational um, for 4-H and the kids and the horses and all that. We get it for rodeo. Um, that's the culture thing that we want to support. So we didn't want to put too much cost on this. We asked everyone, okay, then you stand up as industry and you self-regulate. The standards then was created with them um, in creating this table. Who gets it? Uh, we left it to industry to communicate it. We actually asked YB to send it out to their uh, customers. But since I've been here, we went through three governors. Uh, since I've been here, we went through four Presidents at YB and JB in the fall. Um, I've been through several directors. 
I think what's missing is sometimes these letters get lost in a file and not put into practice. Um, we ask that both industry and YB start looking at these and how they're going to continue to self-regulate or some other regulation might be necessary. But I think for most responsible people, uh, they are retrofitting their containers, so it's not an issue. I check with my harbor masters, much improved, no spillage, no leakage. We're happy. Um, as a result, we don't have to charge YB for cleaning up. That means and the uh, consumers save because of an unplanned cost, or they can then make a little bit more rather than spend that. So some of these things we had, if you look at it, it was quite comprehensive. Harbor operations relocated where we would put some of these things. Oahu, this is where we, we said we were going to go. Then eventually they changed it because this was back in several years ago. Uh, Kauai doesn't have a problem. Not Kauai High, uh, as Councilman Richards was saying, there used to be a pen over there. We des designated a location there. Water is nearby. Maui used to be there, we relocated it. So in the interest of time, after the Friday meeting, um, I had to get permission from the Director of Transportation for me to participate in this, and so, and with YB on this matter. Um, if I may, in looking at solutions, uh, I don't know how many copies are there, but. Yeah, you don't have this. Yeah. Uh, Bobby, we already went through this. It goes to my earlier statement that when you start looking at framing the question differently, um, maybe the question was, I need space. So we did. This occurred last week uh, because I heard, what's going on? <laughs> so we got involved. And, and thank you, Commissioner, for sending something to DOT. If not, I would have not, not known as a stakeholder. So thank you for involving us and participating. Um, this project, as you know, is um, similar to that picture up there. Right where they said the livestock is, is where it is. Right now, under the project, there is a outfall there, a city wall outfall that we have to extend. That's what's causing us to take that space away. Construction is out to, uh, it's on the bid for market. Uh, we're responding to Q and A's to the construction contract that we're soliciting for for phase two. We think we might be opening bids in April. By the time we execute contracts and everything, then. Uh, we can't do anything during the coral spawning season, so September is the earliest they can do construction in the water, but they may award the contract and then mobilize all the big equipment that's necessary in the yard. Phase one is supposed to be completed in November. How much space will be available in phase one because it's all concrete? Uh, it's not known yet since contractor for number two might want to use that space to stay some equipment for the work on the water side. So as they move from west to east, as you can see from that picture, or well, you don't only part of that pier that you see where Young Brothers said that that's also going to be under construction to create a new thousand feet. Uh, that will not be done, and I'll correct YB, it won't be done for three years. So about September 2023, if there's no protests, <laughs> It could be if there's a protest that we might be looking at January, December, uh, December of 2023 or January before they start work. So in understanding that, we looked at a location right behind the Department of Ag building. That building um, is called the formerly the Triple F building. If you flip to the back side of that picture, you'll see where this area, there's a stoplight called Mokuea Street. Okay, If you look in need to get to the Department of Ag, this is the road that uh, there's a stoplight that can move in. That blue line between that is an alleyway between the Department of Ag fence 
and the triple F building. Because of that fence, it creates a non-cost barrier for transport. It also has a ramp in case horses need to go. But this building is old. It has uh, asbestos in the siding. The wood structure in there is eight by eight piles. Um, Triple F used to operate on there until I saw their new location in Pro City somewhere. So this building has been abandoned. We were looking to um, do something with this building, but there's a whole lot of construction going on in there that um, could be used for a transfer. And also, while they're only concerned about animals right now, I'm concerned about LCL, the less than container load. Um, from my perspective, it's a security problem. Um, having those people walking around without properly having quick cards. Um, Coast Guard is being very kind to them. From our perspective, I think that needs to be consolidated really off-site. Uh, it makes more sense. And I think anybody who's been stuck in traffic in that right lane to the Nimitz and or during lunchtime walking by and see that line, somebody is paying that driver or somebody is losing money per container from Sand Island to that location. Um, we are very cognizant of that. We were trying to have a temporary road move from Sand Island through formerly the Kapalama military called Road 2, past Surfco, all the way inside, avoiding all Kalihikai. With construction and with sea level rise, they raise this thing two feet higher. So now I can't get into the area. Um, we have to figure out a different way, but we were counting 15 to 1,700 trucks a week um, passing there. About half of that was coming from Sand Island over to Young Brothers. So we understand what traffic is. This is supposed to reduce, because of the inner terminal transfer between Pesha and YB, almost a natural partnership between both parties. It should help reduce the traffic. Still, this facility needs an off-site facility for um, animal transfers, other animal issues. And we're sensitive that if the state owns it, ag doesn't have to pay. Nobody pay land rents. Nobody pays the county taxes. Is the benefits ag, which goes to uh, Councilman Richard's point about trying to keep costs down and making sure that if we're going to rely on sustainability, um, the state Department of Transportation has to participate in some way to keep costs down. Um, there are real costs to the uh, to YB, but for us. Uh, Holistically, it's for everybody, right, for the whole state. So we're not necessarily driven by revenues. We are <laughs> because we have to pay for this monstrosity, about a half a billion dollars worth of construction, but it's for the benefit of the public good. And in this particular case, if they're willing to look at it, I can't solve this problem by myself. Um, so we're reaching out to the Department of Ag. Um, I reached out to the Department of Business and Economic Development. and. Uh, <laughs> My friend on Maui, my, my friends on Maui, uh, I reached out to uh, DBED to see what grants might be available, and we're trying to have a meeting sometime around February 13th. Uh, I met with uh, Director McCartney last night. Uh, so I'm trying to move as quickly as possible upon hearing this from last week here and trying to move with Godspeed to try and resolve a lot of issues as well as clarify a lot of um, passionate uh, statements and positions being stated. But I'm not a stakeholder in per se. I'm a facilitator and actually links everybody together as the landlord. So um, we do affect costs. We can affect their operation and efficiencies. You will not be able to have this hearing if you only had half the room. You can now have this if we gave you more space as a state, more efficient, more pleasant space matters, and we as a state contributes either to the productivity or to their costs. Okay. So um, 
if we ever get back together, I'll let YB look at this. I walked with industry on this on Friday afternoon. It's quite exciting, except um, we have to figure out how to handle traffic in and out of this. Uh, but I'll let uh, other people talk to this uh, possibility. I'm not an expert in it, but if we can make it available and we can make it happen, uh, certainly we're willing to participate and help. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yogi. Can you, uh, there's a lot of information, commissioners, any questions quickly? I think. This, yeah. Davis, uh, uh, the, the consent decree, that's done. Uh, we're, no, we're we under, we still, under. still under inspection by the EPA and the Department of Health. Okay, that includes the audits, that, the annual audits or whatever. The yes, does. Uh, okay. they're a tenant and we're required to do tenant inspections. If okay. not, then we send them notification. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Our leverage to them is they don't comply, we pull their lease. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anything else? No, I just want to thank you for coming so prepared. and. Oh, it's, I've you. been living this and Appreciate I thought it. I... I put it to bed, but um, grass grows. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next, we have a few people that have uh, indicated possible if they were going to speak. Uh, Bobby Furious. I knew somehow I was going to have to follow that tough act. <laughs> So I'm not nearly as prepared. Bobby Farias, um, local rancher. Kauai is our ranch. Um, we own a facility here, a harvest facility in Honolulu. So I don't like to say it in public too much, but I guess I'm a resident of Oahu almost full time now. So Kauai, Kauai used to be home plate. But thank you for having um, this opportunity. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, you know, not again. Lots of good points were made, and so you know, not to go back into all of that depth, but. I think um, I want to start off with, you know, YB has been a great partner in this space. Um, this is a rough business to be in. As we saw the numbers, right, it's not a lucrative business. And whenever it's not lucrative, it's hard to be called a business. Um, but yet the um, opportunity is afforded to the livestock industry. And I think um, with great um, opportunity, right, I mean, there's two sailings a week that we can get on. Um, and come into port and have that opportunity again to move livestock on a negative income uh, business plan. So I applaud them for being partners in that opportunity, right? Oh, here we are begging for more um, more opportunity, actually, I guess, more opportunity than is already there, and um, yet knowing the economics, right? So. Again, I think I call that a partner in the space, and we need partnerships to grow this industry we're in. But the, you know, the best part of it all is that all the industries are talking. Uh, we had a great meeting Friday. I mean, there was a lot of um, uh, explanation on sort of the timeline. And so as recent as last Friday, um, I felt the meeting was very meaningful in the sense that we all agreed that you know, Young Brothers was going to that one, it was reiterated that it was a proposal, the changes, and that the dates weren't going to go, in, go into effect. I think that was a misconception on everybody's part that that February 1st was going to actually have some action item. Um, and so there was a letter that was put out to the a livestock industry that reiterated that that wasn't going to happen. Um, and I think that was a major step in the right direction, right? It opened the doors for more discussion. Um, and like today, right, the discussion is that everybody's looking for solutions. Um, Mr. Yogi just gave some great opportunity to some other, you know, looking outside the box, if you would, like the Maui situation. Um, again, the, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to focus on that cost is going to drive all decisions because that could get dangerous, right? We could cheapen up a lot of things, but there would be some inherent problems that come along with it, right? So, yes, we've got to be cost cognizant, but we also have to make sure that, again, right, this is a business and it has to be treated like a business. Um, you know, Young Brothers, we, we have to conduct ourselves so that the partnership can afford safety and, again, some business opportunities there so that there is that opportunity long term, right? Hawaii Meats, we represent over 100 ranchers, and we want to make sure that service is available 
for a long time to come because those ranching families depend on that service. If there's some increase of costs that come along with it, we have to you know, watch that it doesn't go out, outside of our ability to operate as a, as a profitable business on the livestock side also. But again, we, we can't hamper the opportunity so that it's cheap enough to transfer animals from island to island, but yet we don't allow the partnership, in this case, Young Brothers, to keep that a viable option for us, right? I mean, that's the only way we get between islands. So again, I just like to say that, you know, I think Young Brothers through all of this has been a great partner. I mean, no transfers, you know, there's documents that go back to 2014, right? The point is, is they've kept that opportunity available to the industry and the conversations have continued. And with that, again, there's lots of opportunity to get to a great resolution to all of this. And uh, that's all I'd like to say. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farias. Uh, next is Scott and Ray. Okay. Uh, next is Linda Rosehill. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next is K.L. Mung. Not quite as big, though. Thank you. Um, I put together a whole bunch of questions. A lot of them have already been answered by previous people. My main concern at this point in time is that Young Brothers is claiming that they've been transparent, they've had these meetings, and these proposals weren't meant to go anywhere. Back in... Um, Back in 2014, we had a notification put on counters and handed to us when we went in to ship our livestock. It was not a proposal. It was, you are going to do this, and you're not going to be able to do this. And it was in stone. We went, um, uh, several of us livestock shippers, Mr. Baltazar and I, Gerald Bueno, um, and... Uh, Bud Gibson, went to Senator English, and we showed him the letter that we got, the notification, it wasn't a letter, notification that Young Brothers was basically strangling us. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't transfer. We couldn't use the devices, and it had to cease and desist immediately. Well, <clears throat> I talked to an attorney because in this notification, shippers would go onto the pier, we would be liable for anything that happened, whether it was Young Brothers ran their forklifts through our containers, or they dropped a box and killed an animal. They were going to be responsible. In this new document, this proposal that they say were just proposals, and it was told to me about 90 times, it's in red, it's just a proposal. But on the back of the page, here again, it's like a threat to us as livestock shippers that we're going to get this done and you're going to have to follow the rules. And this is how it's been. I have not been invited to a meeting since the September meeting when we met with um, the CEO and Chris Martin and everybody and they put on this beautiful show. We had a... We had a, a I don't know what she was called, a negotiator or a facilitator for the meeting. It was wonderful. We got a lot accomplished, I thought. Um, one of the things, thank you, Chris, for the cattlemen, and hopefully sometimes our, our um, horses or whatever can be transferred from the outside islands on a Friday. Um, it's very helpful to a lot of people, um, especially I have a situation where I have people that transfer their livestock all the way from the Kau District, Hilo, it's an hour and a half, two and a half hours, three hours sometimes for them to get livestock to the pier to ship. Well, they also have livestock coming in, but it's on a different day. So that's two times a week. These people, one horse maybe, maybe a few sheep for a 4-H um, kid and a high, the high school rodeo kids. And so they miss the barge. They got to bring their animal, go pick it up. Take it back, and then oh, the other guys that are going that way, they got to wait another several days. 
to make this trip. This will really help because if we are allowed to do that, that Friday they come in from they come into Kauai High from Honolulu, so they can pick up. If they are allowed to ship back, they bring that horse or that whatever the commodity is, cows or whatever, they bring them down and put them on the barge and we get them here on Saturday. And again, I thank Chris for making that happen. It took a while. We asked for a long time for it. And I didn't understand the logistics. It was mostly the cattlemen. And uh, now that I read it more about it, I've figured it out with the schedules and stuff. Um, I haven't been invited to any meetings. I thought all the meetings from November to December were specifically about cattle. It was after their last meeting in December that I received, and the notification, the pro proposals I got were just two pages. It didn't include the rest of it. Um, they had the meeting on Friday. I put together a book like this for one of the cattlemen, because it was only cattlemen that were invited, no other stakeholders. Um, and I put this together, and it was given to everybody at Young Brothers. I made seven of them. It was given to them. I'll give you one, and it chronicalizes everything that happened from that letter and our notification in 2014 to as close as I could get with notifications of everything. And I thank Mr. Yogi for bringing everything because this is what I've been said, saying at every single meeting. What happened to our standards? We worked so hard. Our little task force, we had meetings with the Department of Transportation Harbors, the Department of Agriculture, the state veterinarian. They did research. Ashley Stokes at the time from the University Extension, Ag Extension. She went into all the, tried to do the federal guidelines like, um, the, like they were talking about the interstate transportation. We're unique in Hawaii. We cannot put our animals in a trailer and pull it with a with a truck down the road, go to state fairs, um, state finals for high school rodeo. I can't sell my horse and drive it down the road 15, 20 minutes and get a profit off of it. I have to put it on a barge and pay big bucks to get it there and hope to God that it gets there safely. Um, we standardized, I worked my butt off to go down there. I don't get paid. I go to the pier when I don't have anything, just to meet people to make sure they follow our standards. Because Young Brothers never put anything out after Mr. Yogi sent them those criteria for the standardization of everything and the best practices for our shipping. It sat there all these years and nothing was done. If we can work with them, everybody work with them and get these things done, we don't have to go through all of this no trans threatening no transfers and the safety and everything. We've been safe. Our horses, my horses, my alpacas, and my pet goats have never gotten loose. They've never been running them up. They've never caused injury to anybody. And and that's that's because me as a shipper and an animal lover and a horse owner for all my life, and I'm not going to say how old I am, but I'm ancient. I make sure that everything is taken care of. We need support. Thank you from Dean. He has talked to me several times. He understood. Thank you for facilitating this so you understand where we as shippers and, and transporters are coming from and that we can't be hamstrung. They're the only game in town. They're our only way for all these kids to participate. They they work so hard all year long and then to go to state finals and have to pay an arm and a leg. They can't do it. The fundraisers to get them to the mainland. I My daughter went through high school rodeo. It cost thousands and thousands of dollars. We didn't have that kind of money. My daughter went out and she got sponsors. That's what all the kids seem to be doing because that's the only way the families can afford to do it. Owning a horse, as I testified before, one bale of hay in the mainland is $8. Here in Hawaii, I just got a bale yesterday. I, it went down a dollar. It's $40 now. You know, but that we have to we have to make it sustainable. Like Bobby said, we need the partnership. We all need to work together. But when they start sending out proposals like that, we all feel threatened. I took it as a threat. I was told I was going to have to put my $150,000 client's horse in a container 
put on a truck, truck down the road to a ramp. That is not, the vets will tell you, you do not take a horse, any kind of horse, down a cement cattle ramp and shoot. I've seen them die like that, and I won't do it, and I really appreciate you trying to get to the bottom of this and have this meeting and get everybody to work together, and I think we should go with Mr. Yogi and work, work it out. He has the right. I don't know about this facility. To me, I, I worry that it's a, away from Young Brothers um, facility. Are they going to have guards on the gate? Are, you know, are we going to have to contend with people coming in and out? Who's going to provide the guard system? Um, also, if we do use this warehouse, where is the forklift coming from? to pick up our containers, the, the cattle containers, the box stalls, any of the containers. They have to go down this back road here. This road is generally packed all the way to Sand Island with truckers getting in the back gate. So I, I see a traffic problem already. Um, the Nimitz Highway has been, it's been a debacle. Um, and a part of that is because Young Brothers changed their, their rules and their gate times and their um, shipping um, schedules. So with all of those changes made, it's caused some more traffic problems and stuff. So I, I hopefully it can be worked out. Thank you. Do you want to provide a yes. binder if you can give yeah. that to our attorney? Appreciate it. We have one more, well, it's sort of with a group here, so Jesse Andrade and Shauna Raposa. Yeah, okay. Um, now we've worked through those who have signed up. Uh, Mr. Nasheen in the Consumer Advocates Office. Is there anybody else who wanted to ask a few questions? Yeah. Um, so, if I can clarify, Young Brothers, it's, it seems like there might have been some practices where you hope for some. Good answer. Sorry. So, it, for, from my understanding, it, it seems like there may, might have been some instances, and, and this might not be an isolated in, incident because this issue came up in the last week case as well, where there may be certain company practices that aren't consistent with the tariffs. So, for instance, it, it suggests that in, in your proposal here, um, where there will be additional days where um, livestock could be shipped, but right now in the tariff, it doesn't seem like Young brothers should be allowed to limit the days on, on which the live the, the livestock should be shipped, because you, you folks are suggesting that you're going to allow shipping on additional days. But if you look at the existing sailing schedule, there's nothing that says that livestock can't be shipped on the days that you folks are now saying you you will allow shipping. Is that right, or am I misreading that? Or if if I can say, you know, um, previously we. Um, used to allow shipments of cattle from the Kauai and Nawili Wili on Thursdays, I mean on Fridays, arriving into Honolulu on Saturdays. And at that time, this happened probably about four years ago, we had um, tugs that were pretty outdated and didn't have the towing capacity for the newer barges that we purchased back in 2008 and 2009. So the return barges that were getting back into Honolulu from the Wili Wili and Kauai was getting back three o'clock at times. So there was an additional cost on us to have people on board to service the livestock. So we, we told the, um, the livestock industry, the cattlemen's industry that we will review this situation once again when we started having our, our new um, tugs that came on board back in 2019, 2018 and 2019. So that's when this proposal came back out is we will go ahead and allow um, shipments of livestock from Kauai High and Nawili Wili uh, Friday back into Honolulu on, on Saturday. Can I clarify the point that uh, Keith's trying to make just to make sure that the group understands? And correct me if I'm wrong, Chris. All right, so it was limited largely because uh, based on arrival time, uh, customers wouldn't be able to pick up the livestock. Uh, and so the livestock, you know, you can't leave an animal on pier. Uh, and so that's that's part of why we had to discontinue the shipment for that particular sailing. Uh, so it was, it was really in the interest of the safety of the livestock. 
Okay, and, and, and thank you for that clarification. But I, I guess the next question would be, why wouldn't that have resulted in a tariff transmitter with the commission to indicate that you folks are going to deviate from the commission approved tariff? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so, so I mean, and I guess just to kind of get an understanding, I, I think um, there, there's now going to be this effort to have further discussions with the stakeholders about the proposed changes and the, the two-page letter or maybe five-page letter is, is not necessarily going to be adopted because it certainly hasn't been proposed in the instant rate case. Do you folks agree that most of the changes, if any changes occur, would need to be part of either a tariff filing or a rate case? Because um, it seems like, but again, you folks might have implemented certain practices that really should have resulted in a filing before the commission to ensure that there was an opportunity, a transparent opportunity to review the changes and to have the commission approve it. Uh, just kind of want to get feedback on that. I mean, I think we're willing to look at it all. There are some procedural aspects that are more operational that I think don't appropriately go into the tariff. I mean, more rating and commodity schedules and I, rules around when livestock can be dropped off, but how to handle an animal may not necessarily be something that would be appropriate in the tariff. So I think that's something that we should continue talking about. Okay. Um, and, and just so um, that I can understand, you, you folks are proposing the, the use of either 20-foot or 40-foot or, or containers, but again, for, for some other shippers who may not necessarily have more than a single animal to ship, are there other options? Because, for instance, you folks have G-vans for uh, LCL carriage, and you, you don't necessarily require an LCL customer to use a 20-foot or 40-foot or container. So. Are there other options that could be considered with respect to what might be used for um, something with, such as a single animal or? Trailers yeah. is, is also another option. Okay, so so right now the options you, you folks are considering are trailers, the 20 foot and the 40 right. foot. And, and if there are other solutions available, and, and, and I know it's, it's kind of a limited industry in terms of um, inter-island shipping, but are, are there other options that might be out there that you folks looked at but aren't considering? We, uh, like we talked about, we're, the, the discussions are ongoing, and mm -hmm. uh, we've not seen a specific type of other shipping device that, that is available, but if there's one that came about or was brought to the forefront that we could uh, agree upon was safe and, and mm -hmm. useful, uh, for both the industry as well as uh, practical for us to ship, then we would be open to that. Okay. So, well, I, I mean, ultimately, it's still subject to additional discussions that right. are expected to occur with various stakeholders. And and I guess if, if you can help me sort of understand, what additional procedures are you going to have to have um, these discussions? Because I, I think there were a few comments that you, you folks may, may have met with some cattlemen and whatnot, but to the extent that there are also other people who rely on Young Brothers Services, um, what opportunities are there for the inclusion of their comments as well in some of those future discussions? Yeah, we'd like to um, include everybody as best as possible. Sometimes a larger group um, it's not as effective. Um, I think so. We've talked with the industry and we try to, you know, make sure we capture all of the shippers, right? Everybody from the horse to the cattle, uh, to the goat shipper, to the hogs. Um, we want to make sure everybody's well represented. Um, but I will be honest and say that sometimes a larger audience of just of having an email blast to everybody is not the correct avenue. I think some of the reason we're still talking about this from some of the stuff that happened in 2014 is because the, big, the bigger group never really came out with solutions, right? It was just we had discussions and we never really got any um, momentum to move forward. So the idea is not to not include everybody. The goal is to try to get everybody well represented. Like I said, we just, these ongoing discussions, that's one of the things we talked about is, you know, basic live talk training from the industry, right? I think that would be helpful for the Steve Loring group, but also designating some key representative. Maybe there's you know, maybe each one of those types of animal is represented by somebody that's the designated person. But we don't know. It's still new and part of the discussion. But the goal is to create the right audience so we can 
uh, move quickly. The DOT repairs, KCT, it's gonna, it's all happening, right? So we, we, we need to kind of move. Um, time is of an essence. And, and so, so again, just from my enlightenment, there, there was that discussion Friday. Was the Department of Agriculture also involved in that meeting? Because I, I think there, again, there were comments from Mr. Yogi about you know potentially some assistance might be useful from the Department of Ag. Because I, I think what we'd want to try to avoid is potentially if, if certain standards are adopted that may not necessarily be consistent with Department of Ag, and then there may be conflicts between what you folks may be discussing with the stakeholders and Department of Ag later telling you guys, yeah, that doesn't work. So I, I would think the maybe not necessarily putting at odd with what you just said about trying to make it too large, but I, I would think we should try to make sure that there isn't a situation where we go too far down without making sure that there's some feedback from relevant or, or stakeholders who should have a say and, and make sure there is uh, there are opportunities to coordinate between uh, especially Department of Ag and Department of Transportation in terms of developing standards, if any. Um, and then and going back to what, what's being proposed, and I think it was a, a, addressed a little bit, but if, if you folks are suggesting that there should be standards or certifications as it relates to some of the containers, do you guys have current thoughts about who would do that besides self-certification? Self no, we don't. Right. Would, would that be something that where either Department of Ag should have some feedback as to what might be safe for the animals and or Department of Transportation. So if we get back to the letter that was issued, I believe by, I don't know if it was Davis or your predecessor, um, you know, was it you, David? Um, you know, it was really, you know, so the ask was to have the industry work on those standards and to educate the balance of the group and then identify a potential um, um, resource to certify. And, and that's kind of where we stand today, right? I mean, that's the, the, the onus was really put on the industry to develop the standard and identify a certifier. So I just want to clarify that because at a point there was a couple of times where, where it was stated that YB came up with this standard and such, and that, that's not the case, right? We didn't develop the, we collaborated in that effort, but we didn't develop the standard. Um, but, you know, as I think Commissioner Potter asked earlier, do we have an idea of who, who it would uh, certify at this point? No, not. Really, I mean, there's obviously there's there's the ones that we use today for Coast Guard and um, you know DMV, but as you suggested, right, Department of Ag may have some say as well. Um, you know, it could be any one of those resources. So it may be consistent with what Commissioner Potter was raising. If if a single agency doesn't necessarily step up to the plate, so to speak, is that something that maybe shouldn't be imposed? Because otherwise, it would seem to put. Um, to create a tension, right, in the sense that if there's a requirement for certification but no one's going to do the certification, well, what happens? I mean, can, what can mean? Shippers, I mean, could shippers actually use the service or are they stuck because they can't provide a certified container? Well, you know, I, I guess we'd have to also talk to our landlord, right? Are the landlords imposing this requirement that, that there's a standard established and if we don't comply with that, we could also be, you know, evicted. Um, so, you know, it's about managing all of these different, you know, obviously we don't want to cross that road, but we want to work with all the stakeholders to make sure that we're in a position to ensure that that we can operate safely both for our employees, our customers, as well as the livestock. Um, and, I'm, you know, uh, uh, whether someone comes to the table or forefront and is willing to, you know, uh, certify this, these devices or not, I, I don't know. Hopefully that's not the case, but, um, you know, um, we have to continue to explore that. I don't think, I guess to your point, I guess to answer your question specifically, if no one comes to the table uh, and we'd have to talk about this, I, I, you know, we'd have to come to some kind of um, compromise to say, well, how are we going to continue to provide this service to our customers without the certification? But I don't think YB by itself can make that, that um, you know, decision. Great. Sorry, I, I know that's probably a question that's maybe better answered once we get a little further down with some of these discussions, but I, I, I was just trying to figure out whether or not customers would have a potential avenue for some for using the service if there's no ability to offer up a certified container because there's no certified or agency that certifies. And if, I'm sorry, can you say If I can just add to what, what Jay was saying, you know, some of the, the things that were thrown across the board, um, in the discussion with, you know, um, the DOT, with the, uh, what you call it, the livestock industry, 
was to have a, um, and I think that's evident in, in one of the papers that was put, um, put forward, was to have the um, industry come up with a board on each island that could, if there cannot, if, if, if a third party certifier cannot be found, then to have an advisory board on each island where shippers can go to and they can determine that um, that shipping device is, is suitable for, for shipping. Okay, sorry, I, and not, not to harp on this, but you know, based on what you folks are proposing and will likely discuss with in further discussions with stakeholders, are there any immediate changes that should be made to the tariff because you're not necessarily following the tariff that is currently approved by the commission? It sounds like we may need to look at the delivery and cutoff times and, yeah. you know, restrictions related to that. That may be something that we, we need to look at and propose a change to. But aside from that, I think we haven't done a comprehensive look. I know that there are currently um, requirements that allow for crates, which is where box stalls, I believe, fall into. So um, there isn't a whole lot, and you've probably seen it written in the tariff around handling of livestock. And so I think currently there isn't anything that's in violation of it other than maybe what you've just raised. Okay. Right. Thank you. Hold on. Well, I, I probably have additional questions, but they may come in the form of IRs and ratios. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just one. Full confidence. Okay. Um, we do want to be mindful. Oh, just, just, I mean, just two more cents. Um, I think it'd be easy to find somebody to standardize trailers and containers, um, just because it's standard shipping devices within the industry, right? But as we mentioned before, box laws, YB might be the only one in the nation that uses these type of devices. So, so to find somebody to certify might be difficult. So again, it's what we're trying to certify. If it's containers, we could probably have somebody and contacts of who could be doing it. But again, we're talking about everything right now. So it's still doing the game. So to find somebody to actually certify box laws, I think we're, we're a ways away. Thank you. Uh, we all be mindful of, oh, sorry, Mr. Uh, Regarding certification, the certification was to make sure that there was no leakage or spillage. The design of the uh, shipping device was for the protection of the animals. That's why the veterinarians from the Department of Ag and University of Hawaii participated in it. I wouldn't be able to regulate that. The question always comes up is what happens to the the up-and-coming rancher that wants to do something and that entrepreneur, that agricultural entrepreneur can't afford this container that we're asking for. This container that they might be talking about certification is meeting Coast Guard 40-foot containers because it's already certified. Some of the comments made by other people who have been to retrofit some of these certified um, Department of Transportation only want to make sure that we're compliant with animal safety uh, because of our sister agency. And everything that was in it stayed with it, uh, so it didn't cause an environmental issue. Other than that, um, the only point I need to make is with regards to our alternative, whoever is going to be the operator of this, then that's – so it just happened over the weekend. Um, I'm trying to make connections with other agencies. I have to find a, someone who's going to be responsible to address chaos issue about fence lines, turning radiuses, water, electricity, um, who's responsible for liability of issues. There's a whole bunch of operational issues. I don't have a clue. So the DOT has always offered its BTC capabilities because we're connected to all the ports. So if we need to have a conversation with everyone, just go down to the Harbor Master's office, dial in because the Harbor Master's have the video conferencing provided by the state. So we can have a conversation. But I, there are multiple issues where we're offering a possible solution. It's still in the exploratory stage. 
because I don't know what the livestock people need other than, hey, look, I got shade. Hey, I got a roadway. Hey, I got space. Hey, I got a place to keep them. Possible. Now we have to work to the details and uh, what lies within it. So just want to make that comment uh, that self-certification really was for that purpose to the benefit of the industry. Uh, and also their certification might be different. So terminology, let's be clear what these purposes were. And uh, don't walk away from this place with too many assumptions and interpretations because it gets kind of technical in industry jargon, government bureaucracy words, and how you might be interpreting as, wow, this is different for us. So we have to be clear in our words because it could be interpreted very differently. So we welcome everyone. Uh, just come with an open mind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that word. Be mindful of the time we've set for this. Uh, so, any closing comments from the commissioners? Oh, I just want to thank everyone for your willingness to be here on fairly short notice. Everyone on the phone that hung with us, thank you to Young Brothers uh, for bringing your team here. Uh, particular thank you, Mr. Yogi, for bring for uh, history lesson plus. Um, Offering what we hope are constructive solutions on a short time frame. Uh, appreciate that. It's not my job, but I'll do it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we need a lot of that. Uh, we'll report well to your uh, leadership on your willingness to be here and help. Uh, thanks to folks in the room, everyone on the phone again. Uh, the commission will take this under advisement. I think we heard a lot, we learned a lot. Um, and I think we understand there's a role to help facilitate compromise and solution here, and we'll continue to do that and communicate that. So thanks, and that concludes our meeting today.